I'm delighted to see so many people here this afternoon, and I'm glad you chose my presentation to come into it, because today we're going to be talking about resilience and promoting well-being. And I wish I had 40 hours with you to talk about resilience and well-being, because sometimes it takes that long. We've got 40 minutes, and hopefully you'll go away with at least one thing today. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. We do have a question and answer session at the end, but if there's any question you're thinking of during the presentation, just please ask, and I'd be only too glad to, to, to answer it for you. So my name is John McGuire. As that I work as a counsellor and psychotherapist. I am a critical incident responder and well-being specialist, so all those fancy titles. But what I like about the work I do as a counsellor and psychotherapist is what I bring into the room and what I bring to presentations as well, and that is my life experience and my humanity. Because without those two things in the room, I don't think I'd get very far. Yeah, I went to college, done all the tests and done everything else to do, but no college will ever teach me what my clients teach me. And I think my clients have taught me more about resilience in my lifetime than I could have ever learned on my own. I'm 62 years of age. I've got a little bit of life experience there, and I know the power of resilience. And everybody's resilience level is different. And when we say the word resilience, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? when you think resilience? Strength. I read a definition of resilience <laughs> once, and I got a bit upset by it, because I had this one line of saying that resilience is that ability to bounce back. Now, what does that tell you when you hear that line? Which? Well, I, I, think, I, think then, I think it's giving out the wrong message then. Resilient is the ability to bounce back. I think resilience helps us to face adversity and to be able to manage it and move on with our lives without letting it interfere in our lives too much. That doesn't mean, though, that we don't feel or we don't have the emotions. We're not super people. We don't have a cape and we can cope with everything. And believe it or not, anybody ever see the Superman movie? Or the Superwoman movie, for that matter? We mustn't discriminate. What happens in those two movies, they have to take a break as well, you know? So resilience is that ability to be able to reach out and ask for that help when we least expect it. So in my work as a counselor and psychotherapist, I have no magic powder, I have no fairy dust, no potions or lotions to make anybody better. The only person that can make you better is you. And with resilience, we will be able to do that. So this presentation today is about general well-being. Mental health, physical health, we'll go through all of those things this afternoon as well in our short session. And don't forget, if there's any questions, please ask. So I'd like to start off with our first slide. What is mental health? Anybody want to give me an idea? Will I give you a hand? <laughs> so put your hands up if you felt happy in the last two weeks. Put your hands up if you felt sad in the last two weeks. Put your hands up if you felt stressed in the last two weeks. Put your hands up if you felt anxious in the last two weeks. So what is your mental health? Your mental health is your emotions. The sadness, the happiness, the ups and the downs. And particularly stress. I have a huge interest in stress. Because we all think we cope well with stress, don't we? And I'm sure you know that stress can either be good or it can be bad for us. And it's how we manage that stress that makes things a little bit better for us. And what happens if we don't look after our stress? Any ideas? That could happen too, or you give up. What does stress do to us when it gets out of hand? We're all very capable people, 
we become somewhat incapable when we're stressed because we're not functioning at the level we need to function at. And what happens when we're stressed? What's the worst thing we do when we're stressed? We don't look after ourselves. We don't talk to anybody about it. And we talked about mental health. And when I say mental health to people, they mention schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. So we have to distinguish between mental health problems and mental wellness, which we will discuss in our presentation today as well. So we all have mental health. Mental health relates to how we think, feel, behave, and interact with other people. So it's really important that we have connections in life, that we have friends and <coughs> colleagues in the office, somebody we can turn to, somebody we can talk to. Really, really important. Have you ever felt, oh gosh, I want to get away from this crowd. I wish I was on a desert island. I wouldn't have to talk to them. But you know something? If you went onto a desert island, you'd be very lonely and you'd be craving for people's company. <laughs> because people need people. We cannot get on without each other. That's why it's so important to have connections. Everybody hearing me okay? Great. So well-being. This presentation focuses on mental rather than physical well-being. How would you define well-being? What is well-being? We hear about it all the time now, don't we? Thank goodness. <laughs> we were silent for an awful long time. Any idea what well-being is? Absolutely. In what ways? <laughs> you didn't think you were only one. <laughs> no pressure. Wouldn't that be lovely? But I think pressure can be good as well. Because when you're going on holidays, aren't you pressured? Aren't you stressed when you go on holidays? You make sure you got your tickets, your underwear, toothpaste, and all the essentials. And you make sure you get to the airport in time. So there's pressure. But pressure can be good, just like stress can be good or bad. And we have a little video to show you later all about stress. I think it's a terrific video. And hopefully you'll get a lot from that as well. I would define well-being. I work as a counsellor psychotherapist, so I'm prone to what we call vicarious trauma. Have you ever heard of that? There's a big word for you now. Vicarious trauma is when I suffer somebody else's trauma. So you can imagine all the stories I'm hearing in the counselling room. What would happen if I didn't look after myself? What would happen to me if I didn't go and talk to somebody about how I've been affected by somebody who comes into the room? Absolutely. I wouldn't be a very effective counsellor, would I? And I'd be doing you the service of if I was in that room in that condition. So I make sure I look after myself. I go horse riding. And I just love it. Just give me a reason to go horse riding and I'll be down there like a flash. So that's my therapy. But I still go for counselling as well, but just to escape and horseback and go across it. So that's my version of well-being. So my well-being is, is going horse riding, reaching out and talking and looking for support when I need it. I work as a counsellor and psychotherapist. Have I got my life sorted out? Be interesting to hear this. <laughs> what do you think? No, Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. And you know something? I don't think you'll ever find the perfect counsellor. No such a thing. <clears throat> so well-being is made up of two key elements, feeling good and functioning well. And what kinds of things contribute to your own sense of mental well-being? Just think about that, because I think... In our busy world today, we're living in a global economy. <coughs> we have technology beyond belief now. These little phones, this phone here in my hand is more powerful than the first computer ever made. I can get emails, I can be contacted by anybody at any time. So I have to manage that well. So put those away when you don't need them. They're only a nuisance some of the time. So just think about what you do at the moment for your well-being. I mean, we always talk about doing exercise, going for walks and stuff like that. And they're great things to do because they do help us. They do reduce that stress a little bit. But there's no good doing that unless, you got, unless you're dealing with the issue that caused the stress in the first place. I have loads of people who come to me in the counselling room who are stressed at work, but they're afraid to talk about it. But they're also not doing anything to alleviate that stress as well because they feel powerless. Not because they don't have the ability to correct it, it's just they get so stressed and it's like a fog comes over them and they can't see the wood for the trees. So reaching out and being able to talk to somebody can help you see things from a different perspective. And we'll always encourage well-being, about exercise and diet or whatever makes you feel good. So positive mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life 
can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Are we like that all the time? <laughs> no, we're not. Wouldn't it be lovely to be like that? So don't be worrying, gosh, I'm not even like that. Probably once or twice a week I'd be in that position. But I suppose the, the good thing or bad thing about being a counsellor, I, ha I have that awareness. I know if there's something wrong, I need to do something about it. And that can be difficult sometimes. Because when we're dealing with emotionals, we're, we're dealing with emotional pain. We have two worlds I look at. We have our emotional world and we have our intellectual world. We can always find solving solutions to our intellectual world. Is there a solution to emotion? I think the only way to manage emotion is to go through it. And it means facing up to that emotional pain which we're plagued with sometimes. Even the emotional pain of suffering from stress and not being able to talk about it can be quite difficult. People with mental health problems say that the social stigma attached to mental ill health and the discrimination they experience can make their difficulties worse and make it harder to recover. So when you're stressed and you've nobody you think to talk about it, what happens to the stress? What happens to you? Do you bottle it all up and then you get physically unwell? Anxiety, stress and depression are the most common problems, with about 1 in 10 people affected at any given time. 1 to 2 people in every 100 will experience a serious mental health problem such as bipolar disorder, psychosis or schizophrenia in their lifetime. So I was talking about mental unwellness earlier on and mental health problems. What is mental unwellness? Are we all mentally unwell? Can we be all mentally unwell from time to time? What would you classify as mental unwellness? Anxiety, stress. What happens when we don't look after those things? We might end up being the one in four people that have a mental health problem in the country. So it's about maintenance and minding yourself and reaching out. And they are all the components of resilience. In fact, the most resilient people in the world have faced huge adversity in their lives. And when I talk about that, I think of 9-11, the time that the terrorists came down in New York. There was massive resilience at that time. That doesn't mean that people don't suffer with post-traumatic stress disorder or they're not troubled by the situation, but hopefully they've reached out and are getting support with that. And we were talking about trauma earlier on. What is trauma? When I ask that question, lots of people think about the big catastrophes in the world. When trauma comes into a life, it's normally an experience that's outside of our normal everyday experience. It doesn't have to be the bigger things. It can be the smallest of things. That old expression, one man's meat is another man's poison. <clears throat> so one in four people will experience a mental health problem at some point in their lives. Around one in 10 children experience mental health problems, unfortunately, and I think that's getting worse because of social media and everything else that's going on. Depression affects around 1 in 12 of the whole population, and 450 million people worldwide have a mental health problem. What does the world look like when you, when you hear that line? 450 million people worldwide have a mental health problem. Does it stop the world from turning? Does it stop people from getting on with their lives? No, it doesn't. Because we can recover or we can manage our mental health as well. There's going to be, tomorrow you might be happy. Look at the, the quiz I gave you at the beginning. Hands up if you've been angry in the last week. And quite a lot of people were angry during the week. <laughs> and probably for good reason too. <clears throat> so we always talk about physical health. It's simple, isn't it? What is physical health? It's the headaches and the broken legs and the sore throats and I'm not feeling well today and I'm hungover and everything else. So what happens when your physical health breaks down? What do you do? You go to the doctor. Do you talk to your friends and relations about it? As long as it's not too personal. <laughs> and how can we maintain physical health? By getting checkouts. We've no problem at all going to the doctor or going for the x-ray or going for the scans or wherever we do. But what happens when we just changed the title to that one. 
and we look at mental health. What is mental health? I think we have a little idea of what that is. I'm still learning every day. <laughs> what happens when mental health breaks down? So what do you do when you're not feeling mentally well? Do you go to the doctor? Do you talk to your friends about it? Do you talk to your colleagues about it? And you see, there's a double-edged sword. When we're physically unwell and we do nothing about it, we may, may end up with a mental health problem. When we have a mental health problem and we don't do anything about it, we might end up with a mental health issue and we also might end up with a, a physical issue as well because we haven't been looking out for mental health. So resilience helps us to reach out and seek that support that we need. I wasn't a great talker in my early days. I wasn't great at reaching out. And I wish I could turn back the clock and change those times, but I can't. But I'll do everything in my power today that if something's troubling me, as difficult as it is, I will reach out to somebody. And that can make an awful difference in my life as well. And I encourage you to do the same. Yeah, we may all be here from the corporate world, but what thing have we got in common? We're all human beings. We all have emotions, we all have feelings. Forget about your title as manager or HR. You're a human being at the end of it. I do an awful lot of critical incident responses. And when I go in, HR will always talk to me. But who are the last people that HR look after? Themselves. Because they're too busy looking after everybody else. <laughs> So recovery, most people who experience mental health problems recover fully or can live with and manage them, especially if they get help early on. And earlier on I was talking about stress. I do, I'm big into stress. I love cognitive behavior therapy. Has anybody ever heard of CBT? And CBT looks after the, the thought process or behaviors and the consequences of those behaviors and tries to bring about change. And change is very difficult, isn't it? No matter how good change is for us, we always struggle a little bit with it. And why is that? We're creatures of habit. We live in our little comfort zones, and no matter what's happening in there, good, bad, or indifferent, we will always go back there. Because what stops us from going forward? And it's a four-letter word beginning with F. Fear stops us from going ahead. So here's a little video I came across. I came across this, gosh, probably about 10 years ago. And I actually use it from time to time as a resource material for myself because it reminds me that I'm human and that we've all been here at some stage in our life. So we'll have a look at this and see what you think. Can you all hear it? Hi, Dr. McGinnis. Welcome to this visual lecture answering the question, what is the single most important thing we can do to manage our stress? A few years ago, we moved our family to France for three months. It was the time of the European Cup football championships, and, and so we would take our kids to the local bar to watch the game on TV. Watching the moods of people from Rugby match last Sunday. Day of the match compared with the five days on either side of the match. There was no such effect on French men or women from either country for that matter. So this story is striking because it, it's about one event and, and really one negative health outcome of stress. But in reality, stress is very complex, multiple factors and multiple outcomes. The physiologists see stress as increased blood pressure, heart rate, or changes in the chemicals that launch the immune system. The social worker sees vulnerability social networks, coping, and problem-solving skills. The doctor sees increased visits. It's estimated that up to 70% of primary care visits are stress-related. Worse health outcomes, bad self-treatment with alcohol and drugs, gateways to depression and anxiety, and of course, a worse quality of life. These perspectives represent the standard negative picture of stress, but I believe we also see a positive side of stress. Athletes were able to find a stress level that is high, but, but not too high for optimal performance. Executives or, or mothers or, or aid workers who manage stress like a bicycle tire. They regulate enough pressure to keep rolling, but not, not too much so that if they hit a bump, they explode. 
And to me, this is really the most interesting question when we look at stress and health. How do some people undergoing intense stress remain healthy and even thrive? And what makes them stress resistant? Well, I think the answer is big. It includes factors like how much control people feel they have in their lives, their social networks, I mean that in the old sense of the word, openness to change, attitudes like optimism, self-care skills such as exercising and, and humor and so on. Research on mental health shows that we have sort of bent a lot more severe mental health issues. We try to figure out what works and, and what doesn't, which is great, but we've done much less research on the most common problem, stress, and when it is steady, it's usually in the context of other diseases. So based on the current literature, my pick for the single most effective treatment for managing stress is actually kind of a simple one. Change your thinking style. Most people think stress is something that happens to us, like a piece of steel on a bridge that is constantly being stressed and then eventually snaps. This is a physical model, but it's, it's actually not the human model. The difference is that stress passes through a two-pound piece of tissue on the top of your face called your brain. So we say things like, my job is stressful, or my friend is really <coughs> stressing me out. But in fact, we create the stress in our brains. Your work or, or Sylvia isn't stressful, it's your thinking that brings the stress. Your brain is, is a volume dial that can turn the stress up, but I think it can also turn it down. People think we were born with certain attitudes and a, and a thinking style, but the truth is stress management is a skill that can be learned. Dr. Matt Skullickson and his colleagues in Uppsala, Sweden, published a trial in 2011 in the Annals of Internal Medicine, following over 400 people, mostly women, who had had significant heart events such as a heart attack or, or bypass surgery. Half the group received usual care, and the other half got usual care plus cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. CBT has become an umbrella term where you learn practical techniques such as problem solving, relaxation, and, and challenging common thinking traps. So for example, a negative filter. So five people say, great job, and one says nothing, and you think you blew it. Uh, fortune telling, I'm not going to that job interview, they'll just reject me. Mind reading, a friend walks by you without noticing and you, you assume he dislikes you now. Polarizing or black and white thinking, I failed my diet by eating that piece of cake, now I might as well eat the whole thing, and so on. But a thought record is then used to reframe your automatic thinking into more healthy thinking. As the American psychologist William James said over a hundred years ago, the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. So the researchers want to see if people could use these techniques to reduce the daily experience of stress, time urgency, and hostility. And if so, could that lead to better outcomes? So, so not a drug, not a diet, not a stent, just changing the way you think. The participants were followed for over seven years. Those that got the CBT had a 41% reduction in heart attacks and a 28% lower death rate. The more CBT sessions the person attended, the better they did. Now another way to change your thinking style in order to reduce stress is through the use of mindfulness techniques. Mindfulness used to be more for what I would call the kumbaya crowd, but the programs have actually become much more mainstream. In fact, my patients with heart attacks or have chronic diseases now often take a mindfulness course as part of their treatment, and there's a growing evidence about its effectiveness. A recent trial following clinically depressed patients with Dr. Zindel Siegel and colleagues from the University of Toronto is a good example. When the patients experienced remission, they were randomized to an antidepressant or a placebo or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. The results showed that mindfulness was as protective against relapse as the medications. My sense is that the success of mindfulness is due partly to the fact that it combines many useful techniques for stress reduction, such as increased self-awareness, involving a physical component like breathing or muscle relaxation, meditation, and perhaps most importantly in our busy world, an emphasis on letting go of distractions and being in the moment. Mindfulness can give us the ability to let go of worry and, and not get trapped in the anxious loops. Perhaps less about changing the thought and, and really more about choosing where to place your attention. As the famous Austrian psychiatrist Viktor Frankl pointed out, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And I think mindfulness teaches us awareness of that space and, and that we have the power of choice. So another factor that the research tells us impacts your thinking style is your attitude, your outlook on life. 
Dr. Suzanne Kabas and her colleagues from the University of Chicago looked at this by following a natural experiment in the 1980s breakup of the Ma Bell telephone company. They followed who cooked well and who didn't and identified three key traits of those that cooked well. The first notion was commitment. The stress-resistant executives were committed to different aspects of their lives. So even while facing uncertainty, they stayed committed to quality work, to engaging with family and friends, their communities, their faith, their hobbies. They saw, and I think were committed to, the bigger picture of success. And this allowed them to weather the turbulence in, in a specific area of their lives. The second notion was control. And this is interesting in that because of restructuring, these executives actually had little control. In fact, you might say their skill in fighting stress was more about being able to let go of control. They could see that the sand was shifting, and, and if they were too rigid in their control of a territory or a department, they might actually lose a bigger opportunity or even their job. Other psychological research is focused on what we call locus of control or self-efficacy, which is really the extent to which individuals believe they can control events and affect them and their competence or, or ability to make change. The executives may have understood that a lot of what was happening was out of their control, but they could adapt and, and I think even choose and, and feel confident about what they could control. The third notion was change. The stress-resistant execs were able to limit their self-importance and, and see the change happening around them as a potential stepping stone, not a stumbling block. So as we come to the end of our story about what reduces stress, you might be happy to know that the research has shown that simply writing out a stress story can make a big difference. The act of giving coherence and, and I think creating your own personal narrative to stressful events in a letter can be an effective way of negating the stress of those events. The classic therapeutic letter writing exercise is writing a letter to somebody who stresses you out and then not posting it. Finally, I'd like to leave you with this advice to improve your thinking style. Think basics. When I play tennis and things are going badly, which is often the case, I forget about everything else and say, move your feet, watch the ball. That's it. When things are stressful, sometimes you need to keep it simple. Say to yourself, I will keep a regular sleep routine. I will avoid eating crap. I will walk. I will mingle. And, and I think there's some early evidence for altruism for doing good. As Abe Lincoln said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. And that is my religion. Now, I'm often reminded about the power of simplicity from a, a lesson one of my patients taught me. I did deliver bad news to him, and when I did, he kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, eh, I'll be okay. I followed the 90 10 rule. 10% 10 of how we do in life is based on what happens to us, and 90% is how we respond. I think the same may be true of stress. So take a deep breath, think about your big picture of commitment, your sense of control, your openness to change. Consider doing some homework on yourself. Reframe your thinking. Redirect your attention. Maybe write a letter. Repeatedly, the evidence shows that if people manage their stress well, they have better health outcomes for virtually any disease they may suffer from. And remember, the challenges will always be out there. That's life. But remember, too, that your thoughts and your attitude are the key holders for the stress you experience. Not the traffic, not your boss, not your job, not your neighbor. But you. It's something you can improve your thinking. Hope this helps. Thanks for listening. I hope you got something from that video. As I said earlier on, that there's a video I use for my own resources from time to time because I think it has some powerful messages in there and also some very good programs for building on our resilience program as well. And we, I don't think we give much talk to our resilience, but if we just stop for a moment and mindfulness, as he spoke about in the video, can help us to stay in the present moment, to take a breath and just reflect on what's happening. Because back to CBT again, there's a central model to CBT, which is called the ABC model, where A is an activating event we're, we're, that we're affected by, B is a belief we form around the activating event, and C is the consequence of that belief. And what if we could go back and look at the belief from a different perspective, or do a bit of reframing on it, then it might change the consequence, which might lead to less stress and other things going on in our lives. So that video is available on YouTube, and uh, it's called the 90-10 rule. If anybody wants to uh, include it in their well-being program, I would certainly recommend it. I can't write prescriptions, but I would certainly write a prescription for that. <clears throat>
So we're talking about resilience today, so just to go through the 10 pillars of resilience just before we wrap up. And so resilience is an important trait in developing positive mental health, really, really important, because it helps us to get on with our lives, to reach out when we need support. And I, I can't remind you enough that being resilient doesn't mean we don't have the emotional responses that are there. We're still sad, we still get stressed, but we know to do something about it to help us move on. And don't forget, our resilience can be eroded away as well if we don't look after our mental health. <clears throat> so resilience is not a trait people either have or do not have, regardless of race, age, gender, creed, etc. It involves behaviours, thoughts and actions that can be learned and developed by anyone. Have we all got different levels of resilience, what do you think? Absolutely. Are we born with resilience? I think we are. Somebody disputed that with me one day. I think it takes an awful lot of resilience to, be, to come out of the womb, to get out into the world again. What a journey for both child and mother. <laughs> so both need resilience at that stage. In fact, those we would define as resilient often have the skill, thanks to action and learning through life experience, that involve considerable emotional distress. I'm sure everybody in this room has had life experience. Think about how you got through it. What did you do to that things got better? Yeah, we can be angry, we can be sad, but we can be happy as well. We're not constantly sad or angry. If you are constantly sad or angry, I'd be making that phone call to talk to somebody. <clears throat> so resilience is the ability to cope with life's challenges and to adapt to adversity. Your levels of resilience can change over the course of your life, just depending on what you're going through. Resilience is important because it can help to protect against the development of some mental health problems. Resilience helps us to maintain our well-being in difficult circumstances. And if you just think about it today or later on tonight, what type of things make you feel more or less resilient and able to cope? And I, I find that if there's something you want to improve on, it's to buddy up with somebody to make sure that you go carry it out. Because you know what a New Year's resolution... How many people made a New Year's resolution this year? You're on your own. <laughs> Did you stick to it? Good for you. The rest of them didn't just say they're all ashamed. <laughs> So think about later on what type of things make you feel more or less resilient. High levels of well-being don't just lead to fewer mental health problems. They, they, improve, they help us with improved learning and academic achievement, um, help us reduce absence from work due to sickness. In fact, talking about absence from work, what's the biggest problem today? Presenteeism. Have you ever heard of that word? <laughs> well, you're present at work in body, but you're not there in spirit. And I think it has a, it has a greater effect on the workplace. Um, helps with reductions in risk-taking behaviours like smoking, drinking, drug-taking, uh, gives you improved physical health, reduced mortality and increased involvement. Resilience can be achieved by learning and developing the following ten pillars. Number one, make connections. Really, really important. People need people. We can't live without each other, believe it or not, even though we want to. But that won't last for too long. <coughs> Forge positive relations with people at work people in your family and people who've got nothing to do with both. Now, why is that? Because if you fall out with one group, at least you've got somebody else to talk to. <laughs> they might help you to get back with the first group you, you fell out with. See crisis events as they are. Stop seeing major trauma and crisis events as insurmountable problems. And I know that I go out to an awful lot of redundancies in the workplace and people think their lives are over. And yet, it's not nice getting that bad news that we're being made redundant, but hopefully we can talk to them because re redundancy is trauma. And it just uh, upsets us when we hear news like that. There's an old Vietnamese proverb that uh, uh, exemplifies this strength well. You cannot change what has happened, for that is in the past. You can, however, control how we respond to the past. So the past is in the past where it belongs. It's written in stone, we can't change it. What can we do from our past? We can learn from it. So sometimes it is necessary to go back and say, OK, what can I do different the next time that happens? Pillar three, accept change, which is difficult for to do. Change is very good for us, but fear stops us from making that change. And I can testify to that. <clears throat> Take action. Do something about achieving your goals. If you don't have any, get some. Set achievable goals rather than wasting time on learning to fly without wings. Because if we set a big goal and we don't achieve, what happens to us? We get disillusioned and disappointed. So only set achievable goals along the way. Be decisive. Do not, face, do not avoid facing adversity. Confront the problem head on and take decisive action to improve the situation or ensure it does not repeat itself in your life. Self-improve. Here's the exercise one. Be active in finding ways to improve yourself 
and don't be frightened to get you know to get to, your, to get to know yourself better. What's the most difficult relationship we have? The one with ourselves, and we always putting ourselves down. Then what happens to our positive self-regard? It goes out the window. And then how does that make us feel? Less of a human being and incapable. So a bit more positive regard for yourself. Find reasons to have a strong sense of self-worth and value in the world. Develop positive self-regard. Take time to find reasons why you're important and focus energy on developing confidence. You got here today. It's not always easy to come into these talks. And I'm glad I'm so delighted to see so many people here today. And I hope he's got at least one thing from this presentation. Pillar 8, keep things in perspective. And when we lose perspective, stop and think, what am I responding to? What am I reacting to? And when confronting mountains, view them in the perspective of the greater challenge ahead. Even Mount Ephesus looks tiny from the moon. I've never seen it from the moon, but somebody told me about it. <clears throat> Pillar 9, be hopeful. Don't ever lose hope. Go ahead and find it if you've lost it. Because when we lose hope and we bring helplessness along with the same, then we're in a bad place. And I'd be making phone calls at that stage. So learn to see what you want rather than worrying about what you fear, which is what we often confuse as what we see. <coughs> is that a familiar saying to you? <clears throat> and pillar 10, take care of yourself. Pay attention to your own needs and feelings. Keep yourself healthy, fit, and well. Invest energy into eating healthily, not going to McDonald's. Gentle exercise and maintaining a positive frame of mind. Reach out to a trusted friend, to your GP, or to your employee assistance provider. And if you're looking for an employee assistance provider, you can talk to Inspire, and I have some catalogues and brochures here as well. So these are the first steps in improving and maintaining resilience and promoting well-being. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and attention, and it's great to see you.